Good morning. Uh, we're coming to you Wednesday morning. Um, this is uh, Jeff Price, and I'm joined again today by Pastor Trent Bodecker, and we're from Grace Gospel Church in Ada, Ohio. And uh, our congregation, again, is reading through the Bible, and we've made several podcasts. And uh, Pastor, I think this is our third podcast, and so we're uh, making our way through. Actually, uh, the people are ahead of us, and we're kind of picking up and uh, some of the the details maybe in in, um, in in discussing it. But again, just trying to um, trying to encourage uh, reading of God's word, and especially in this case, reading through the Bible uh, in this year, two thousand twenty three. Um, good morning, Pastor. Morning, and I, I just want to add, I've really enjoyed these these um, podcasts. It's a chance. Sometimes we read and we rush through the reading, but this is a chance to kind of process what we're reading and to think about some of the things that we've we've uh, we've picked up along the way. So I, I've enjoyed it. I hope other people are. I know other people are, too. Yeah, well, it's good. I'm going to open in prayer and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, uh, it, Pastor and I join here together. Uh, we are gathered here in your name, even though we're separated by distance. We know that your presence can be here. And so we ask for it and we pray that you would guide our discussion as we look into your word today. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to you and and uh, discussing uh, your word and uh, help us, Father, to understand it, that we may get to know you better and even come to a more loving relationship uh, and, and understanding. So, Father, we give this time to you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Pastor, I've got some uh, questions teed up here for you, so uh, we'll get started. Uh, number one, uh, why did the Lord take the Israelites on a more southerly route? As you look at the map, uh, they kind of went straight across, across the Red Sea, and then went actually south towards Sinai, uh, Mount Sinai. Obviously, we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that, but the direct route would have been a more northerly route right up along the seacoast. That you, you think that would have been an easier route, right? Mm -hmm. Because it probably wouldn't have been as mountainous. Uh, so what, what was the purpose of the Lord's? Yeah, I think this is one of those details we could miss if we didn't look up, pull up the map and just look at it and see the the route that they took. But you're right. They took like the long, we talked about the long route, they, the scenic route. They took the scenic route and and maybe the scenery wasn't the, the exciting scenery. It was the <laughs> desert scenery. But yeah, there's a there's a reference there in, in the, the passage where it talks about um, God, God took them that way because the Philistines, uh, they would have had to go through the land of the Philistines if they had taken the direct route. And they weren't ready for war. Um, they and in fact, in in Numbers, there's a passage in Numbers four. Well, I know we're not there yet, but Numbers fourteen three, when they did finally encounter war, they cried out, "Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword?" And so, that was later on after they had witnessed God's power, God's miracles, God's provision, and they were still complaining. And they would have, if they had met with that right right from the get go, they would have just turned around and gone home, or or back to Egypt. Back to Egypt. Um, but so I, I think that's part of it, and at part of it is God was going to show His glory at the red the the Red Sea where you know, they were pinned in against the sea, and God opened the path to to God knew He was going to do that, um, you know. And I I I think um, there were a lot of lessons to be learned along the difficult route, and I I, I think you had you had mentioned in the question, can we re can we relate to that? And I think God doesn't always take us the straight the straight route. Yeah. Sometimes we follow the difficult route and there are lessons that are learned along the way and things we might have missed or, or blessings we might have missed or or um, a chance to grow with God, uh, to learn to trust in God if we had gone the easy route. So, um, I mean, th those are some thoughts Did you had. I think you had some thoughts as well. I think that's a good thoughts. Uh, you know, sometimes you get frustrated with God. I just want to get to to my destination. Um you know, when, when Tressa and I, we, we like to travel and, um, you know, you stay on the interstate and you, and you get there a little quicker, but you, uh, miss a lot of the scenery in between. I tend to like to drive, uh, you know, the more state highways, uh, and, uh, and Tressa would attest to the fact that I, I get off road, uh, once in a while and, uh, 
like to take the circuitous route. That frustrates her a little bit sometimes, probably. But uh, I think we can relate to that in our own Christian life. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get to to where God wants us to be, but really, it's all about preparation, and um, that's all. That's all in fulfilling the purpose that God has for us, and He's preparing our mm -hmm. hearts, He's preparing our minds. In this case, He's preparing them, the Israelites, uh, for the things that they're going to have to face. So, I think it's good. It, it's a great analogy. You you pointed that out. All right, number two, um, <clears throat> boy. We can relate to this one too. There was a lot of grumbling as the Lord led them through this uh, wilderness to Mount Sinai. Uh, they grumbled over water. They grumbled over food. They grumbled the fact that uh, the uh, the Egyptians were chasing them. Um, and then God provides in all of these uh, different situations. So again, Pastor, maybe speak to uh, some of uh, how God provided for um, Israel on their journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we we talked about doing word studies last last week, uh, Sunday, Sunday morning, and this would be a great word study, the word grumble, because it just comes up again and again and again and again all throughout the passage. And if, in fact, Paul, and I, I think 1 Corinthians talks about them grumbling in the desert. And um, yeah, I mean, God, God over and over again, there's in, in Exodus 15, there's the waters of Mara, which were bitter, and the people grumbled. And so God made the water sweet. Then the people were hungry, and they grumbled. And so God gave them manna and 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 meat. And then they grumbled again in chapter 17. So it's like 15, 16, 17. Like they grumbled, <laughs> they grumbled, they grumbled. And God meets the need. And yeah, I, I think there's there's this, um, we, we see the lack of faith that the people, they God proves again and again that he's trustworthy. But there's a lack of faith, and I, I, I think we we can be guilty of that as well. It's easy to grumble, and I mean, we fall into that habit. I think a lot of times, um, and maybe don't we don't realize that that maybe we're not trusting God when we do that. I, um, but God God proves that He's trustworthy. He will provide. Yeah, um, you know, as a pastor, you I mean, I know you're not going to say here, but uh, you you. I mean, we grumble as our, as parishioners. We we do, um, you know, and that that's human nature. Um, it's not right, um, but it is uh, it is sort of human nature to do that. And I think uh, in this case, uh, leadership uh, is shown. You know, Moses uh, providing that leadership, that stability, mm -hmm. um, and not. He's not throwing up his hands. He's not panicking. He's he's trusting. And so, uh, you know, speaking to you uh, as our as our pastor, I think uh, that's one thing that it's a it's a good trait that you have. Um, that you are trusting the Lord, and uh, sometimes we we uh, you know see things going on in the world. And we say, Pastor, Pastor, man, did you see this, man? What's going on? You know, and. And you always seem to have that, you know, kind of cool, uh, you know, answer and, and level headedness. So I think that, uh, you know, um, that's needed. It's needed. It's it's one of the reasons why we have pastors, why we have leaders, why we have elders. Um, and and um, so I think that that is good. But, um, yeah, I mean, we have manna today. We have the word of God. We have his 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 water, the Holy Spirit, uh, you might say. Um, I like the, um, I like where Moses, what's he, do you remember what he threw into the water to make it sweet? Is it like a, a stick? Yeah, uh, it was wood. It was, it was, it was et. It was uh, the Hebrew word et. It was wood. It, it and, and, you know, he, and maybe it's not exactly the cross, but it's, it is wood. It is, it is uh, maybe a, a foreshadowing of, of what saves us, uh, later on. So, um, I think that that was a, why, why did, why did God pick wood, um, ets to, uh, throw into the water because it was maybe a part of the cross or I, I you know, I don't want to stretch that too far, but, um, it's just the fact that he chose that. Why, mm -hmm. why he could have chose, he could have just had Moses raise his stick over the water or whatever, you know, but, Right. right. Yeah. 
let's go on. We got to we got to move on here. We're trying to keep to 20 minutes or or so. So uh, number three, the Lord gave the Israelites all of these uh, these laws, especially, I mean, laid out the Ten Commandments and then a lot of other uh, laws at Sinai. What were what were the purposes of these laws, Pastor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I looked up and someone, some rabbi had counted all the, the statements from Genesis through Deuteronomy, do this or <laughs> don't do this. And they counted uh, 613 commandments. So they yeah. talked about the 613 commands. Uh, but the, the why, why did God give the law? I think that's a huge question, an important question. And the first thing we need to say is he did not give the law to be a ladder that man can climb, use to climb our way to him. God, God did not ever intend the law to be a ladder for humanity to climb our way to God through ritual and, and works and, and religion. Uh, that's not why he gave the law. And I think um, in, in the New Testament, especially, I know I'm jumping ahead, but but Paul talks about the law and the purposes of the law. And in Romans, um, he says in, in Romans uh, chapter 3, 19 and 20, uh, he talks about how the law, the law speaks to humanity and condemns humanity. And Paul says um, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so the law in, in that sense is sort of like a mirror that shows us how like if you have spaghetti sauce all over your, your you know, in your beard, um, you know, I look in the mirror and it's like, oh, I see, I see how messy I am. Uh, the mirror shows me how messy I am. And the law shows us how sinful we are. So I think to show us, to hold us accountable before God or to show us our um, our need for forgiveness. And then in Galatians 3, so so one, one reason for the law is to, to show us our sin. Uh, Galatians uh, 3, 24 says, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. And so I think the, the, the sacrifices of the law points us to the, to the Savior at the same time. So those, those are those reasons for the law. Yeah. I, that, that's very good. You know, I, whether it's in the old, old Testament, new Testament, uh, um, you know, whatever dispensation you would find yourself in really God desires a relationship with us and not it. And I mean, and I think that what happened over the course of many, many years is, uh, of course, Judaism uh, took the law to and try to keep the letter of the law, trying to earn their way into uh, God, the God's grace, uh, rather than just accepting the grace that He had uh, freely given them, and uh, forgetting about the blessings that we're going to read about later on in Deuteronomy, and always remembering the curses. And here's what happens if you don't, you know, keep the law. So, um, yeah. So the law is supposed to lead us to Christ rather than uh, be a way, a means uh, to attain salvation. So uh, the the next one, maybe uh, spend just a little bit of time. The purpose of the tabernacle, talk a little bit about that. And there's, you know, uh, as I read through there, I was kept thinking, man, all of these utensils and all of this, you know, the color of the embroidery and the rings and the, Alder and the table of showbread and uh, holy of holies and all of the intricate details that are there and boy it would be easy to get bogged down into that but I mean there's actually volumes books uh, volumes written about this um, what can we what can maybe just the layperson who's reading through the Bible here kind of glean from um, maybe an understanding of what what the tabernacle was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was the focus of Israel's worship, and then of course the tabernacle would be replaced with the temple. But but some some big things that we learn from the tabernacle is God's desire to dwell among His people. So that sort of points us back to the Garden of Eden, where God dwelt with Adam and Eve, and, and God has always desired to dwell with humanity. And so uh, the the tabernacle was at the center of the camp, and the tribes would camp along along in a circle. And so God was right there in the center. God was in the midst of, of the people. So I think um, God's presence, God dwelling among his people is a huge thing we learn from that. Uh, we also see the holiness of God in the tabernacle. There were the curtains 
that separated the 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 uh, holy place and the whole, most holy place, and so the people could not enter. The Ark of the Covenant was kept in the most holy place, and so the people couldn't just waltz into the presence of God because of sin. And so God is a holy God, and sinful man can't just waltz into the presence of God. Um, we see the, the the altars, the sacrifices, the ministry of the priests that show us the the need for atonement. That God provides atonement through sacrifice. So those are those are some of the huge, the big picture things we learn from the the tabernacle. And like you said, there's all these details, and we I'm sure we can learn all kinds of things: um, the lampstand and the bread and and all those things that connect with who Christ is. Uh, I think ultimately it points to Christ and His ministry. Yeah. You know, as you were going through there and thinking about that, and I, my mind goes to the throne room in in uh, in heaven, and it's very much the same picture with the throne sitting in the middle and the elders around the outside, the the living creatures and so forth, and and so you have the tent of meeting right in the middle of this congregation of people, God in the middle, the focus point of of uh, of the people's lives, not just their, not just their religious life, but their life period. And I think that that's, I mean, our life is not supposed to just be about Sunday. It's all week long and putting Christ in the middle of our, at the center of our lives each and every day. So I think maybe a, a depiction of that as well. And I, you know, I you, I like to learn the details. I wish I had more knowledge about all of these things. I'm sure that there are a lot more things that we could learn in a I, deeper study. Yeah, I enjoy like the like the, some of the study Bibles, like the ESV study Bible has a great illustration of what the tabernacle looked like. And that's great for people like me because I can't just visualize this just as I'm reading it. Uh, I need those illustrations to help me picture it. And yeah. Like you said, the colors, the different colors that were used, the different right. priestly garments that were used. Actually, Hebrews, uh, this is, you know, you, people can look up uh, later on, he, go to Hebrews and look up the word tabernacle, chapter eight. But the idea that that the tabernacle that Moses built was patterned after the tabernacle above. And so that's this really neat picture there. But look up Hebrews eight. So Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll move along. Uh, our uh, last question here today uh, for this uh, particular passage. By the way, we're in Exodus, uh, Exodus chapters 13 to 32. I don't think I've mentioned that, uh, but that this is kind of the area that we're, that we're studying. Uh, the last question, do people build an image of God uh, out of jewelry uh, during the time that Moses was on the mountain? He was up there actually 40 days. Uh and, you know, what's happened to Moses? He's up there on the mountain and the clouds uh, over. And so the people are in the in the valley below and they're they're uh, You know, this is the whole time that Moses is getting the law and the commandments and and they get they turn their back. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, they they put their jewelry together and Aaron uh, forms it. He puts it in the fire and forms a calf and. So maybe speak to why this is so offensive to God and uh, what the reaction of Moses and God was. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. God gives the, we talked about the Ten Commandments and the first two commands, you will have no other gods before me and you won't make any graven image. And they immediately break those first two commands, like right off the bat. And, and this is after they've said all that the Lord has <laughs> commanded, we will do. And then immediately they break the first two commands. There's that idea of spiritual unfaithfulness that we were made for God by that desire. Only God can satisfy because we think, oh, idolatry, that was ancient Israel. That was people in the past. But he does a good job of showing how we wrestle with idolatry. And I just wanted to read one really quick uh, sentence that he writes about why is this so offensive to God? He says, you can't understand the seriousness of idolatry without understanding the jealousy of God. And you can't understand his jealousy without some understanding of his relentless, powerful love for you because they are intertwined. Yeah. That, that phrase, God says, I'm a jealous God. That's that's a godly jealousy. That yeah. He, anything else that we give our our love to, like any other God, it, it, it brings destruction to our lives. Right. Yeah. And and I think that in in my mind, you know, here we have 
I mean, God is way beyond what we can even uh, think about or imagine. He can't be contained by the whole entire universe, and we know that the universe is uh, is almost limitless. Yet God cannot be contained. He lives outside of that. He He is. He created it, and and man is trying to deduce that down into a, a golden image of any kind is just offensive to, oh, really? This is all you think of me when I am Yahweh? I am God? I um, The all-powerful Elohim, uh, Adonai, all of the, think of the names. You go to the names of Jesus and all the character that, characteristics that he has and and we try to try to put that into a golden image, and uh, yes, it's very offensive to who God is, and we worship the creation rather than the Creator. Yeah, and you think, uh, well, we don't, and you like you pointed out, I think very well. You froze up just a little bit there a couple of times, but I think you pointed out the fact that, oh, we don't think we have idols, but oh yes, we do. Enemy anything that stands between us and and all out. Uh, all out for Jesus uh, is is an idol. And so you have to constantly uh, reflect on our on our lives to see what is what's coming between me and and the study of God's word, the um, you know, me going to prayer, me going to church, all of those things. So, um, you know, I think also you think about the temp to go back to the tabernacle you know, the local church is so important. And and for those of you who, who might be listening and you don't attend church regularly, I'm, you know, I'm not condemning that. We don't live under the law, but at the same time, how, how do you build a relationship when you're not uh, meeting with God and his people in, in a place that he's designated very clearly, the local church uh, designated as a place where we are going to meet. He is going to meet us. Uh, in this dispensation. So we encourage people who, if you're not in church regularly, that you need to be in church regularly to really grow and, and to come to a, a full, a better understanding of who he is. So, all right, pastor, that, uh, that kind of wraps it up. Any, uh, any final thoughts? I think as we get into these the section on the law, sometimes we want to skip through it, but I think there's just so much we can learn from the from these chapters and and can look, you know, look in the in light of what Christ will do. As we read through these chapters, think about the sacrifice that Christ will, you know, will provide and, and how this points us to him. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. Uh, and thanks for those who tuned in and listened to us. Uh, we appreciate uh, if you want to leave some comments uh, for us. If you have questions as you're reading through your passage, maybe this week, if you're following along with us, uh, uh, please put those in the uh, in, in the comment section or uh, give us a thumbs up or a like or something. If you or maybe a thumbs down, maybe you didn't like something about or didn't agree with something. That's fine, too. So anyway, Pastor, uh, we'll look forward to, to seeing you next week and we'll be uh, moving on um, Exodus. And I don't know exactly how far we're uh, actually how far we're reading next week, but that's OK. Yeah. We'll, into, into Leviticus for sure. Yes. OK. All right. All right. See you. Have a good day. All right. We'll see you next time.